Good. By a pillar, but Go I, ahead. I may be on TV screens if a camera swings around. Uh, and I can feel the pent-up energy of questions in the audience, so I will try to be very brief and try to just bring a bit of granularity to uh, the previous presentations with a bit of an Africa perspective. Um, as many of you know, uh, it's very ironic that Africa is facing this financial crisis because finally, after a long slog through the dark, application of more orthodox macroeconomic policy had begun to show results. Um, you were getting growth. You were getting poverty reduction. Uh, you were getting growth at both the uh, general level and in the sectors of the economy that had broad impacts. And then the financial crisis hit, and it looked as if Africa might dodge the worst of that in that their financial sectors were not as exposed to the risk elements that the OECD countries faced. But that has not uh, been the end of the story, and the translation of the financial crisis into a real sector economic crisis is hitting Africa very hard as the level of demand in markets to which they had been exporting is shrinking and one seeing the diverse channels with which that's coming back into the African economy. And so growth predictions for this year have halved. Um, if the sort of consensus uh, models for uh, slow recovery in the OECD hold true, it's expected that growth in Africa might get back up from its current year projection of 2.5 up to about 4 percent next year. So it's it's a significant decline in relation to poverty levels and population growth, but it's not as big a hit as some economies are facing if you take the continent as a whole. Please do bear in mind the caveat that John had. You can do all kinds of typologies of countries in Africa. You can do it many different ways. And so it's quite important to specify what type of country you're talking about, what they're in their initial conditions were in terms of economic robustness, as well as the specificity of the channels of, of impact of the financial crisis on them. Um, but that said, I'd just like to focus on a couple of specificities, then give you a flavor of the discussion that has been taking place over the last couple of days during the spring meetings, how different African countries see their options in responding, and then come back to Joachim's question of what does this imply about our research agenda. Um, in terms of specificity, one thing on the export side, even though in general one hears in the press the disaster cases, the mineral exporting countries like Zambia and DRC where copper prices have collapsed or cut flowers from Kenya or cotton from Burkina Faso, demand really has hit the export potential of those countries. Interestingly, beverages have held up just as restaurant retail sales in Washington. Uh, people don't seem to cut back on some of the simpler uh, comfort luxuries as others. And so tea, coffee, cocoa, prices are where they were um, before the financial crisis. And so those countries are doing relatively okay uh, on balance of payments, um, as are countries that are gold producers. So it's not all gloom and doom on the export side uh, for African countries even those, the, those that are primarily dependent on some parts of, of, of the export economy. On the financial side, we saw the different channels of how development's being financed in terms of external flows. I won't say much at all about FDI. Uh, we know that's been tanking after there'd been a period of really quite healthy growth. Finally, some bright lights on that for Africa, but that's drying up quite quickly. Uh, uh, official development assistance, people are hedging their bets, but most people expect that with the fiscal costs in OECD countries, there's going to be some pressure for levels to be maintained. I'd like to just spend a little bit of time on remittances, where some of the, sort of the, the core expertise in the bank, in a quiet way, is telling a quite a bit more optimistic story than some of the general statements that are coming out. With, for Africa, it being a story where there had been very rapid growth over the last several years, 30 to 40 percent uh, for a couple of years, likely to shrink this year, maybe five, six percent. Lots of caveats here on the dodginess of the numbers, but then some expectation that that'll begin to grow again next year. And these are remittance levels that are significant. Uh, the estimates for 2008 were about 20 billion of inflows. With the sources being quite diversified, 60 percent from the subcontinent itself, 
only about 25% from higher income OECD countries. <coughs> Another characteristic of the remittances is that a significant amount seem to be going into investment expenditure, not just consumption expenditure uh, within uh, the receiving countries. Um, but the, even the consumption expenditure is an important part if you're thinking about these countries' ways of dealing with, with the social pressures of, of, the, of the recession and, and, and food prices and the like, because they come into the economy in a quite different way, different mechanisms, um, and in, in some measure are a compensation for very weak capacities of the governments to implement more formal social safety uh, net mechanisms. So just want to emphasize, again, remittances, they're a quite particular story for Africa. I think there's a lot that's unknown there, and I'll come back to that at the very end. And what are people saying uh, about what the best responses are for the African countries? General sense is that the countries are trying to stay to their macroeconomic uh, policy uh, framework. They've got relatively little room for maneuver on the fiscal side, on the monetary side, and on the exchange rate side uh, for trying to compensate for the fall in demand in their external markets. Let me not get into that now, um, but there are some, some specificities to that to the Africa region. Um, the countries are looking for alternative markets. It's yet one more push to think uh, where are our opportunities more south-south compared to often our historical orientation towards OECD markets. Um, and then there's also a, one group of countries that's thinking what we really ought to be focusing on is being ready for the rebound because that may come as soon as next year. We don't want to put too much into a consumption stimulus when we know that we've got a long-term growth constraint in infrastructure and other types of investment. So to the extent that we can create some room for fiscal space, perhaps through a faster action on debt relief through macroeconomic agreements, maybe the right place to put that is in investment for that future growth path. But there are others that are saying, look, we're also facing some social constraints. We still do have comparatively high food price levels compared to where world prices are now and compared to some of those high value export commodities that we've been producing for uh, before. Maybe now is the time to focus on agricultural diversification into these food staple crops. So that's a little bit riskier in that you're not sure what your time frame is of these relative prices holding forth. Um, but you do have these kind of differentiated stances of different countries. Um, let me then just quickly mention uh, four areas, perhaps, where this suggests we ought to be looking in the future. Um, I'm reminded a little bit of the journalist who asked uh, Louis Armstrong where the future of jazz uh, was heading, and, and Armstrong responded, well, if I knew, I'd be there already. <laughs> uh, but I think in this case, actually, what we're seeing are the critical issues coming out of this financial and then real sector crisis uh, is, is a set of questions where actually we, we already were, as a profession, beginning to put in place, uh, I think, the, the, the analytical programs to sort things out. One is, I think, uh, a conclusion that some are drawing that we're now into an environment of higher price variability with all its implications for macroeconomic management as well as vulnerability management, particularly for food. It's the link of food to fuel. It's kind of back to the chart of, uh, I guess, it, it was it um, Maximo's? Or no, it was yours, Joaquin, that showed the, the financial crisis index with wheat with greater correlation. It's that story at the end there. Well, if that's the case, then we, we really need to be <laughs> sorting that out and, indeed, there's a strong research program on that by yours and, and other institutions. The next that's more specific to Africa is transmission of food prices from international markets to domestic markets. Africa, I believe, uh, but it's to be confirmed, had greater um, stickiness of uh, tr transmission of prices into their domestic economies. Uh, the international price increase was slower to arrive domestically. But now you're seeing just the opposite on the other end. Now international prices have come down more than they have in domestic economies. Is that just a story of the high internal transport costs and other uh, trade facilitation issues? Do we know enough about that? Uh, it seems to me if we're moving into a higher price variability environment, 
and we're concerned about sort of relative price issues guiding investment as well as guiding social safety net uh, uh, responses, we've got to have a better handle on this transmission of price issue and whether that's going to, what can be done to either make it perform better or to understand it better. Um, third point is on remittances. It seems to me there's a lot we don't really know about remittances, how they come into domestic economies in Africa, what the split is between consumption and investment, even when it comes through a household level, how that varies by country. Nigeria may be about half of that 20 billion. And we just, we just are really skeptical about the quality of the numbers, but they're important and have been growing fast, and we need to know more about that. And finally, sub-regional integration. Um, it's been a topic that's been in front of us now for five years or more. There is tremendous potential for domestic growth in Africa to be based on greater sub-regional integration of food markets. Um, some of that is policy, but you have greater movement towards sub-regional uh, trade unions with reduced tariffs. There are some real problems with non-tariff barriers. And then there's just tremendous problems with infrastructure and, and physical costs. But countries want to move in this direction. There's a lot of will, uh, but there are also some, some unknowns about what the welfare changes are going to be spatially. We've got the tools to analyze that kind of thing and assist policymakers, and lots more work is needed there. Thank you.